Oh, it's a privilege. Please call me Tom. Uh, Tom, Victor. Should I call you Victor? And, and the privilege is mine. It's so amazing to meet you, even virtually. <laughs> it's great to meet you. Congratulations on your extraordinary career thus far. It's really what you've accomplished. Uh, I have great admiration for. Well, thank you. And, you know, I, uh, the movie Top Gun obviously had a huge impact on me. And as much as I want to throw Top Gun quotes at you, I won't. I'm sure you get a lot of that. So thank you, because you had a part in that. Boy, that's, that's an honor for me. And I can't wait for you to see the next one, Top Gun Maverick. I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait either. It's an honor. I'm, I'm ready. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm ready to show it to you. I can't wait, man. Awesome. So listen, I have, I have I'm a few excited. questions for you, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Let's do it, Tom. Because obviously you've flown... I guess 40 aircraft over as a test pilot, many different aircrafts, the F-18, it's a naval aviator test pilot. Now flying the Dragon, SpaceX Dragon, how does that compare to that? And what do you think for yourself, what was the most exhilarating aspect? Awesome, you know, the, the Dragon is a, a touch screen. The displays are also where the controls are. And so that's quite yeah. different than flying an aircraft with a, a stick and a throttle. And so when I first saw it, I will be honest with you, I was like, I don't know, guys, I need my inceptors. I need something to move around. Uh, but as I yeah. learned more about what the vehicle does and what, it, what its purpose was, the touch screen actually was wonderful. It worked great. And uh, the most exhilarating part of it all was riding the, the Falcon 9 rocket. It is such a high performing liquid rocket. It's smooth, but it really leapt off the pad. And we got to the 100 kilometer point and we were all smiles. It was just so amazing. You can really feel the accelerations and decelerations. And then once we got onto the upper stage, the second stage, and you just start building speed, it was, I've pulled G's before in fighter aircraft, but to be able to pull G's for almost 10 minutes straight was just power like I've never experienced, not even launching or landing on a carrier. Really? I've been fortunate. I've, I've, I've got some launches and I landed on carriers on the Roosevelt. And uh, that kind of geez, that kind of force coming off there is pretty incredible. What, what was it like in the, with the Dragon? What, what, what did it feel like, with the Falcon 9? I mean, how many geez were you pulling? And I know you're laying down. Yes. What was that like? And so it is different. In the fighter, the G's go from your head to your toe. And that's why we practice these specific uh, maneuvers to, to keep blood flow to your brain so you stay conscious and you don't gray out or black out. The G in, in, uh, on a rocket launch goes into your chest. And so you, ought, you naturally can, can uh, sustain more G's in that direction. And, and the G is actually lower. So the maximum G we saw was about four and a half. But what's different in a fighter, you'll experience, I pulled uh, nine G's in a fighter aircraft, but that was only for seconds. And, you know, I've sustained so three to four G's for maybe a minute or a minute and a half in a dogfight, in a turning fight. But in, on the Falcon, but, uh, except for staging and throttle down, you are accelerating the entire way for about nine minutes. It was about eight minutes and 50 or so seconds. I mean, and you're accelerating the entire way because you'll wind up 200 kilometers above the earth going 17,000 miles per hour. It's an amazing amount of power. And so we, we actually were above three and a half G's for a, about three minutes, which that's which amazing. That's incredible. That is absolutely incredible. I know I've have, I've been fortunate, you know, different aircraft that I've flown is, is those G's and feeling them momentarily nine and a half is, is what I pulled it actually in the F-14, the first top gun, wow. you know, from when we got nine and a half and we, uh, you know, on the new one, we were pulling a lot of different G's, but to sustain that, I was, I was wondering, because I, I always wanted to know what that rocket and feeling that acceleration where you could actually feel that acceleration the whole time. Do you felt that the whole time acceleration on the body? You the whole time, it? the whole time. Yes, you know, coming off the pad initially, it feels like a, a very high speed elevator. You know, the first, the first move off the pad, you're not going very fast and you're actually not accelerating very fast but it just continues to pick up. I mean, the entire time you're moving. And at about one minute into the flight, uh, you get to, you're in the region of maximum dynamic pressure, which you hear people say max Q. And that's where you're in the thickest part of the air down low, but you're also going really fast. And that could actually crumple the, the rocket and the spacecraft. So they actually slow down, they throttle the rocket down. And you feel that, you feel yourself, it's like tapping the brakes. And then really what stands out is the throttle up. Then they go back to full power 
And when they do that, it felt like lighting the afterburner in an F-18. I wish I would have been able to feel what it was like in an F-14 because I hear it is quite impressive, but I, I never got to fly that aircraft. But you definitely feel it the entire way up. And then the first stage shuts down after about two and a half minutes. And then we ride the second stage all the way into orbit. And that one starts just at about 1G. And so again, it's a very light push, but then you push for another six minutes and about half of that time you're above three Gs. And so your chest is very heavy and you have to focus on breathing, inhale, and then the exhale kind of works itself out, you know, because of the pressure. It is quite amazing. It was a truly incredible experience. I did not know you had to work on that, that inhale. That's incredible. That is extraordinary. Yeah. Now, being a NASA astronaut, I mean, you require, you know, constantly pushing the boundaries. And what do you, you know, what is the most physically demanding task, both kind of before and, and after, like during, you know, during the space flight? Yeah. Yeah, great question. You know, and I think it's interesting to think about this. It depends on the time horizon you're looking at. So in the moment, the short term, short duration, most challenging part of what we do, I think, is training for and executing spacewalks. It's six to seven hours of, uh, of working and doing this, these very important things on the outside of the space station in the extreme environment of, of you know, the vacuum of space, high temperatures, low temperatures, no air. And so that life support is critical, but it's also very physically demanding. You're moving around a suit that can weigh with your body in as much as a thousand pounds, and you very rarely use your legs. It's like running two marathons, but on your hands the whole time. Your hands and fingers are very sore when you're done with this. Um, and so that's the most physically challenging thing. And training for it on the ground, you're still in an extreme environment in the neutral buoyancy lab, our 2 million gallon, you know, 40 foot deep pool uh, where we train for spacewalks. And so it's still, it's still also physically demanding even underwater. But when, you, when I think about the duration of a career and maybe something that has a huge impact on, on your lifespan, I think all the traveling and training and the stresses of this job if you don't have healthy ways to manage that stress, it can actually affect your sleep. And then we, we also have to become comfortable sleeping in space, which is an extreme environment. We do lots of outdoor training and you have to be able to sleep outdoors as well. So I think just looking at the way that these things, all of these stresses manifest in your life, you also have to have healthy coping strategies for the travel, all the different time zones we go in and all the different stressors that come with the work. Uh, and then obviously then getting to space and being able to fall asleep and, and get the, the important rest uh, that you need to, to accomplish your work day. That's one I think is a, is a very physically demanding aspect of, of training and living in space. Okay, Victor, there's two, two things. One, I, I, from what I understand, and I, I've been fortunate enough to actually be fitted for a suit uh, years ago, and just feeling the weight on Earth versus, I guess, in zero G. But what people I don't think understand also is, is what I understand, you know this, is how hard it is opening and closing your hand, let alone. Like, talk, to, talk about moving the arms and moving the hands, the stiffness of the suit uh, because of the, yes. the, the pressure differential, just moving your hands, the dexterity of that. Could you, could you, and then the next thing I wanna ask you about is sleep, but could you tell us a little bit okay. about that, please? <laughs> So yes, in that spacesuit, right, you're in the vacuum of space. The pressure there is zero, absolute zero. So you need something to keep your fluids uh, in your blood and, and to help you stay conscious and comfortable. It keeps your temperature uh, in a comfortable range as well. And so the suit is pressurized to four, 4.2 pressure, uh, uh, pounds per square inch, 4.2 PSI. And so the entire suit is at 4.2 PSI and it wants to sit about like this. And so anytime you move, you're moving against four pounds per square inch. And so we have certain bearings. If you rotate your arm like this, you're rotating a bearing. So that's roughly, you get, have to overcome a little friction. But if you move like this, you're pushing against the, the suit, the stiff fabric, the many layers that can maintain that pressure in the vacuum of space. And so when you close your hand, a great example, uh, sometimes you'll hear people say it's like squeezing a tennis ball, but, but squeezing a tennis ball, if you squeeze it, it's work to squeeze it, but then to let it go, it, you know, opening it, it, uh, it pushes against you uh, and helps you out. What I like to say is moving around in the suit is like putting your hand in rice. If you open your hand very wide, you're pushing against that rice. If you close your hand, you're, you're closing it against that rice. And there are some athletes that use buckets of rice to train their grip strength. And I think that's a, a little bit more of an accurate comparison. 
Did you do so, uh, things like that to increase your grip strength? Because even dropping your arms, you talk about pushing it up, but dropping your arms and moving in, in that way. I mean, what did you do anything physically to uh, increase your strength with that? Absolutely. We, we have a great team of, we call them astronaut strength conditioning and rehabilitation specialists, ACERs for short. And our ACERs craft very specific workouts to help us. Like I said, training for spacewalks is also physically rigorous. And so they actually develop those workouts to help us be safe in the neutral buoyancy lab where we train and obviously to, to also help benefit while we're in space. And we do very specific exercises for our grip as well as for our shoulders. Those are two of the areas that, that you really tax when you're doing spacewalk training or an actual uh, walk in space. And so, and the other thing is they give us suggestions on how to work out. For example, when I do my shoulder exercises, I originally started using dumbbells and I would hold the handle and, and do my shoulder exercising, rotating and you know doing things to exercise my rotator cuff and all those small muscles around your shoulders. Uh, what I started doing because of the suggestion of my uh, strength trainer uh, specialist was to use plates, the same weight, but in a plate, and I would pinch them so that during my exercise, I was also increasing the challenge on my grip and, and therefore getting a better grip workout while I was exercising my shoulders. Things like that are the kinds of uh, things that our astronaut strength conditioning and rehabilitation specialists help us with. Did you feel, that's incredible. Did you feel the longer you were up there, because I want to just, just a little question on this also is that you were there for so long and the time when you got there and when you did the spacewalk, was there, do you, is there, what level of depreciation of bone and muscle uh, density is there? And did you feel a difference? Like, is there, what happens to your metabolism with the Krebs cycle, with the mitochondria? Did that affect the spacewalk? Could you tell the difference in terms of your strength on the ground that you built up? Is there a diminishing uh, is there a diminishing effect the longer that you're in space is my question ultimately and, and how did that affect your metabolism, your BMR, you know, with, with calories and nutrition? Did you have to yeah, think about great that? Oh, wow. There's, yeah, there's a lot packed in there. And so I'll, you know, that, uh, that is definitely something we work hard to mitigate. You're going to lose bone and muscle, uh, you know, muscle due to, to potential atrophy from just, you don't, I, I weigh 200 pounds and I'm not carrying that 200 pounds. It's like taking off a 200 pound backpack when I get to weightlessness. And so I'm losing that, uh, that, that effort every day. And so I have to make it up in my workout. Uh, and also your bone density, we have this condition called osteopenia. It's like space induced osteoporosis. Uh, the, the, the enzymes that encourage bone growth, you know, our bones are constantly being, uh, reclaimed or eaten and then reconstituted. And in space, for some reason, the, the process that eats the bone or takes away bone continues, but the part that reforms new bone slows down. And so we try to mitigate that with our strength training and, and also with uh, uh, medication. And so the, the effects there uh, can be, it can have a huge effect on you, but the workouts that we do are one of the biggest mitigators. And so I actually started working out before the, long, before the mission. And then when I got into space, I continue to work out. We get two and a half hours every day to, to do exercise, strength training, uh, cardiovascular training, and then also time to clean up and get ready for the workday. And that was extremely valuable. Now, when I first got to space, my body is going through so many changes. I lost about two kilograms and I was only eating about 2,200 calories. It took me about 45 days to get used to the, the environment, to, to, to come up with some you know, strategies for me to eat like I did on the ground, like keeping snacks in my pocket at all time. And when I started snacking and eating in space more like I did on the ground, I got up to 3,300 or so calories, 3,200 calories a day. And I was also working out very hard. So overall in space, I actually felt stronger than I did on the ground. I was able to work out really hard. In fact, I told myself before flight, I wanted to make sure I didn't get hurt. I didn't want to hurt my back or my shoulders because I wanted to always be ready for the spacewalks and all of the other work on the space station. And so I felt like I could have lifted even heavier and ran harder on the treadmill, but I just didn't want to hurt myself. But uh, the, the strength training and cardio training are, are excellent in space. Incredible. So that it, when you were doing your spacewalks, you didn't feel like you had lost strength. Not at all. By the time we went out the door, I felt stronger, actually. And over my mission, I did lose a little bit of bone mass. I lost about 2% of my bone mass, and they say I'll have that recovered in about a year. 
muscle mass I actually gained. So I told you I lost two kilograms in the first two months. At the end of the mission, though, after the complete six months, I was four kilograms heavier. So I gained back that two and then put four more on. So I came back with more muscle mass than I launched with. Well, that's incredible. And so you feel like did that had a, had a reflection on your metabolism overall? Increased your uh, I metabolism? Think so. I, I think so. I, I think it may have been an increase. I took a test when I got back to, to check our VO2 max. And so the VO2 max is, is a great example of how we're doing metabolically. Uh, and so I, I was in family. I was close to when I launched. And that's what our, our ACERs also are focused on helping us reacclimate to Earth and getting us back to what we were like pre-flight. And so my strength numbers, my bench press squat, my VO2 max, we do that by getting on a cycle and going until we until we fail, uh, pretty much. And uh, they measure our gases that we're in, inspiring and expiring, and, and, and that tells them our VO2 max. And my number was a, a point or two different than what it was pre-flight. And so I would say overall, I was able to maintain my metabolism, and that's pretty impressive considering all of the things that your body is experiencing. That is, that is impressive. Did they test your BMR after the flight to understand what that was? Did that change at all, that number? Uh, I don't, we don't normally do that for, for crew members. I think that's something you can get if you want to. But I was involved in an experiment called myotones, which is studying not just muscle mass, but the quality of your muscle. And it's really looking at this device to see if we can use a very simple external device without having to do like biopsies to determine muscle tissue quality. And so that uh, experiment actually takes 10 measurements all around your body over the course of the mission. And you also have pre-flight and post-flight numbers to compare it to. And so I actually was able to get those kinds of measurements. Uh, uh, but like I said, before what, flight, in flight, and well, after. Yeah, because you were there for six months. What was the difference? Because when we talk about going to the moon, we talk about going to Mars. Was there a, was there a large difference as time went on with those numbers? Uh, it actually, I, I, I lost a little bit in the beginning and gained muscle over time. And so I think my overall proportion stayed the same and being able to maintain what you start with on earth is, is great. That's a great standard. Uh, and, but that's very much because of the amazing exercise equipment. And if you've never seen it, the, the A-RED, it's the advanced resistive exercise device. One of the most important technologies on the space station, in my opinion, it allows us to do uh, all kinds of exercises, bench press, squats, curls. And that machine though, takes up almost half a module. The, the space for the machine, plus the range of motion for the body that you put on it. And so when we go to the moon, we won't be able to do that kind of workout in transit. And that's very important to understand. We're gonna have something smaller, like a rower, like an erg that you would see on earth. But when we get to the moon or to lunar orbit, we're, we're gonna need some type of a habitation module where we can get exercise because that that bone and muscle health, uh, and also it was a part of the uh, of what I enjoyed most during the day. So it's also a part of mental well-being, but it's very important to our physical well-being. Right, so you feel like when we go to Mars, obviously on the planet, there'll be a whole module for it, but on the way to Mars, is there, you feel like we'll need a separate thing. I mean, because we're, you know, when you see 2001, we're talking about, do we do we put a, you know, a force of gravity? When you talk about what the, the difference of, of gravity on Mars versus the moon and, and on the way there, I know there's been a lot of talk and evaluation as to what is, you know, 0.6 uh, gravity on, on the human body. You know, we're all, we don't really know until we get there and it's, it's done for an extended period of time. So, you feel like will we have a, a separate module just on the way to mars that that's what it'll have i think so because with current propulsion technology right we need to get better propulsion technology because if we can shorten the duration of the trip right now it's going to be six to nine months if we can shorten that trip that means less radiation exposure and less time for your body to degrade in weightlessness. But you know, trying to create artificial gravity by spinning one module, that creates guidance and navigation and control challenges due to gyroscopic effects. So it would actually be a little, it would be really complicated to do that. So you're gonna to need to exercise. You're gonna need basic exercise. And something I try to encourage our scientists and our exercise specialists to think, to think about is you know A-RED is a fantastic machine, a wonderful contraption, but we also need to remember I, basic things. I wrestled in college and in high school, and so I think of the most amazing exercise device there is in history is another human body. That's my opinion. 
but you know, also doing calisthenics or just basic isometrics where you push on a structure. And so maybe just getting in the corner of a module and putting your hands and feet against different sides and pushing statically against something or using another crewmate and you both kind of do squat presses where you're pushing against each other. Those are the kinds of things we need to think about and find ways to incorporate so that we not only have the ability to do strength training, but we also have a, a, a backup in case a machine breaks. Because again, on the way to Mars, you're not going to be able to stop off at the hardware store and, and get parts to fix it. And so we need to have a way to back up uh, those exercise devices because it's such a vital a part of, of physical and mental well-being. That's a very good point. That is a very good point. You know, it's interesting because we know what zero G is, you know, have a great idea, I think, of what, what the, how the body behaves under zero G over an extended period of time. And of course on earth, but all those experiments in terms of the moon and, and on our way when we get to Mars, how's the body at 0.6 at the, you know, those different forces of gravity, how will the body develop? Are these things that, that you guys spoke of and as you were preparing for this flight, did you evaluate any of that? Uh, no, we didn't, but uh, I do know that people are thinking about that, the scientific and the medical communities. I know that uh, the crew that just returned, so we just launched a crew to space, that you were, you were there for that launch. There. Well, uh, just prior to that, we, we returned crew too, the crew that flew to yes. space station after us in a Dragon. And when they got back, they actually had an activity just after launch, just, I'm sorry, just after landing, just within hours after they landed, we had activities where they had to climb up a contraption and move some, some large masses. That simulates being able to throw out the emergency equipment into the water if you landed in the water in your capsule after being deconditioned from being in space for an extended period. The moon missions are Apollo astronauts. They say that the, the worst period of deconditioning was after a 14 to 21 day mission in space, somewhere in that third week of being in space. And that's uh, uh, what, what our moon missions will be like. And so coming back, deconditioned, landing in the water and maybe landing off target, we need to know that folks can, can operate and function in that environment. And so we think about it, but for the missions to the station, we're going to be in weightlessness for an extended period and then have to recondition to 1G. And so our focus is on 1G, but I, I do think we need to find ways in that construct to, to, to evaluate things like this, you know, coming back from the moon or being on Mars, because it's, it's amazing. I was just writing an email to the folks that just went up there to Crew 3. And I, one of the things I encouraged them to do was to, to learn the lessons that space is gonna teach you. I used the example of the Apollo astronauts, the hop they would do on the surface of the moon. They, they weren't taught that, they innovated, they figured it out because the environment, it made sense. In that, you know, one sixth of Earth's gravity, they realized it was easier to hop than to try to ambulate, to try to walk like you do on Earth. And so sometimes you just need to be in that environment. Like you said, you need to experience 0.6G to understand how your body wants to operate. And, you know, the physical sense, there's a little genius to the body and, and we need to be good at listening to what our body tells. That's incredible. I know that hop, I was always thinking, you know, you don't want to fall. Do you know what I mean? Because right. damn, you can't damage that suit at all. One thing I just want to ask, like when you did your spacewalk, what happens if you have an itch on your nose, your ear? What, what are you, what are you, what are you, you're thinking like you start sweating, you're going, oh my gosh, you know, are you one of these? I mean, what's, you can't get your arm out to just scratch that. Did you ever have an, uh, you know, right. have an itch somewhere where you're like, man, I can't wait till this is over. I've got to, I'm going to have a good scratch here. Well, yes, I think as soon as you put the suit on and you know you're going to pressurize it, that's when everything does start to feel. You start, oh, is that an itch coming? Uh, but so we actually have a device inside the suit that is for Valsalva. It's just like in airplanes, as you start to descend and you feel the pressure build up in your ears, we have a small foam block that we can push our nostrils against so that we can force air and, and then expand air, air into our eardrums to Valsalva. But that device is used mostly, I, I think I can speak for the entire astronaut core to say it's number one use is to rest your chin on so that you can rest. And then number two is to scratch your face. <laughs> and so there, there is a way to scratch certain itches, depending on if it's in this area, you can scratch it. <laughs> yeah, the only, but when you take the, the suit off, you're, I... you're, you're yeah. When you take the suit off, yeah. quote, I didn't mean to cut you off. I beg your pardon. Yeah, you're you're definitely Please. looking for some relief when you take it off. There's all kind of little itches or aches and pains. And and so, you know, interestingly, I also had 
I had a situation that I almost couldn't do anything about. So we have this anti-fog <laughs> on the inside. We dab just a few drops, wipe it on the entire visor and, and try to get rid of it. And uh, I, there have been other instances of astronauts experiencing the, uh, that anti-fog getting in their eyes. And I don't believe it was the anti-fog I applied to the suit. There's actually an investigation going on to find out where it may have come from. Maybe it was sucked up into the life support system and then pushed back out later. But I had three spacewalks where I felt so I did four total. And on three of those spacewalks, I had something in my eye that caused a burning sensation. And one of those happened while I was working on a pretty important piece of hardware. And so I actually had to just stop and hold still. And I just kept blinking, waiting for my eye to water. And it did. And again, my body took care of itself. And so I just kept blinking and the, the, my eye watering over time, it dissolved whatever that was, but it took time. It wasn't just a small thing that the liquid pushed out. It had to dissolve something and I could feel the burning sensation slowly decrease. And then I was able to see and finish my activity, but it's, it felt like I was standing there out on the mast on the very end of the space station. I was on the solar array, uh, solar array uh, on a space on the space station, and I was way out there waiting for this burning sensation to go away. A pretty interesting experience. I I, I think that's an understatement, isn't it? <laughs> pretty interesting. It was like, okay, wow, that's intense. That is that is that is. It was intense. Congratulations! It, it was. I'm glad you made it through. Did they figure out what that vapor was? Fog solution, uh, but it, there's other things in the suit. You know, we we wear a, a harness that can uh, take biometric measurements. It sees our heart rate, and they can figure out respiration and, and understand how quickly we're going through our oxygen and CO2 scrubbing systems. And so those uh, we have those leads stuck to our body with with an adhesive, but underneath that there is a uh, they they call it the um, the uh, electro gel. And it's this gel that we put on before we stick them to our chest and cover them with tape. Well, that gel could have potentially leaked out as well. And I've never put it in my eye to see what it feels like, but I imagine it wouldn't feel very good. So there are a few things within that sealed volume of the spacesuit that are culprits. And, I, and I'm actually waiting to get the results of the investigation because I'd love to understand that more. I, at this time, I'm not sure what it was. It definitely wasn't water and it wasn't my own sweat. I've had my own sweat in my eyes plenty of times at the gym and it didn't feel like that. Wow, incredible. Yeah. Well, congratulations with that. Thank now, you. Yeah. Let me ask you something. You also, you had, uh, <clears throat> you gave advice to, uh, you know, to the ISS and the group that just took off. What, did you get any good uh, advice as you were a trainee that you applied that the, you, th that you, when you were up there, you thought, you know what, I'm glad they told me this. Oh, so, so often uh, before flight, in, even in flight and even now after flight, you know, uh, some of the, the things that really resonated before flight. So in training, someone said to me, actually several people said it. One of the primary things that we have to do as astronauts is to understand how the training isn't the same as the reality. It's our job to integrate all the training and to, to know how it's different than doing it in weightlessness. And that is just so true. You get there and everything has this one theme, weightlessness. And being in orbit can change everything. The way you brush your teeth, go to the bathroom, eat, drink, and then of course, maintenance, science, and spacewalks. Waking up and going to sleep and waking up again in weightlessness, it's just something that you can't train for on earth. And so you have to learn how to live like that and work like that once you get there. It's on the job training. Another piece of advice before my first spacewalk was to keep your world small. That was such a great thing to think about on your first spacewalk, just going out there and focusing on one thing at a time, because it's really easy to just wanna look at the earth, but that could be overwhelming. And, and since I had never done it, I didn't want to take a chance at, you know, putting myself in a, in a situation where, you know, the anxiety or the nerves took over. You know, I, I think of myself as a steely eyed fighter pilot, but I've never been 260 miles above the surface of the earth and been able to look down and see nothing under my feet. So, so I didn't want to take any chances. And I slowly opened up that view and then was able to take in the, the earth in all its glory. And it was amazing, but I took my time getting there by starting small. Uh, and then I would say my favorite piece of advice was something someone wrote on the space station. We have a, a, a sheet of paper taped to our exercise device, that ARID I was telling you about. 
And it actually has an acronym, please, written down the side, which tells you what to do to, to turn off the machine when you're done exercising. But someone wrote a small message at the very bottom of it. It says, nothing is more important than what you're doing right now. I took a picture of that and I sent it to my family and I sent it to my friends. And I also suggested the crew that just got up there. I didn't tell them what it was. I just told them, go look at the machine and the piece of paper. I meditated on that daily. Every time I passed by it, I read it. And, and even sometimes hourly, I would tell myself that because it's really easy to focus on a spacewalk. But you know what? When I was repairing the toilet, I thought this I, it was just as important as going out into the vacuum of space. Nothing is more important than what you're doing right now because everything that we did in space was so vital. I think that's, that's words uh, of wisdom for life down here on Earth, too. It's, it's an incredible thing. You know, when you talk about uh, space, when you were talking about your purview or your view getting expanding, my question is, have you... Have you skydived before? Have you gone through skydiving and scuba diving? Did you do a lot of that prior to this? You know, I've never been skydiving and I would love to. I would love to do that. Uh, and I hope uh, NASA can integrate that into our training. Our cosmonaut colleagues do that as a part of their training. And so uh, maybe I need to go uh, evaluate the cosmonaut training program so that I can do some skydiving. But I did uh, learn to scuba dive. I actually learned to do it in Guam while I was on a Navy deployment there and uh, before I became an astronaut. And then as a part of this job, when we train in the neutral buoyancy lab with the full pressure suit on, that's considered full pressure suit diving. But sometimes we'll do a practice run without all the other divers and the cameras by ourselves, just with our buddy. And we'll go down in scuba the, the run before so we can see where things are, how we're gonna attack the problem with the tools uh, and how we'll get out and back from the work site as a team. And so we do lots of scuba diving in this job and that is uh, flying and diving are two of the parts of this job that I love the most. Well, uh, it's a great job. I'm gonna take you skydiving. I'll take you skydiving, I'll teach you. Yes, yes please. I'll take you that, we'll do that. We'll do that, okay, I'll call oh, you after, I'll, we'll, I'll figure it out, we'll be, that'll be fun. That'd be really awesome. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're up there, was on the spacewalk, was that the most astonishing view that you had? Was that the moment for you? You know, everyone talks about inside, obviously the Coppola, we've seen those shots and film of that, but outside and looking back at earth or, you know, what, what other things, what, what was, did you see anything else or just share a little bit of that with us, if you don't mind, please. Wow, absolutely. You know, because you're inside the space station, the windows there, you know, it, it is a great view out of the cupola and we have other windows, but when you're outside on a spacewalk, the, that visor wraps around you so that you can, you actually have peripheral view. And so when you can see the, the earth, there's nothing besides that visor between you and the earth and the vacuum of space. And so that is just the most unique way to see the earth from orbit and it is truly breathtaking. That's why it's important to keep your world small. If you walk out and the first thing you do is just stare at the earth, I mean, you, you may be stuck in that for several minutes and you've got work to do in those first few minutes. And it's also important to keep your heart rate low in the first few minutes. So I can tell you more about that later. But that view is very special. It is extremely special. But I think the view that impacted me the most was the first time I saw the earth from orbit. And that was after launch, we got to orbit safely. And now we had 27 hours before we were gonna catch up to the space station and dock. And so we had time to take off our suits and eat and go to the bathroom. And I went to the, to the, the window and looked out. And first of all, the orientation of the earth, I thought, you know, that I was just used to seeing the earth like you see it in this picture, you know, horizon there and the earth down. And it was like sideways. And I felt like I was underneath the earth and I'm looking out and I was just amazed at the view, how much detail that I could see, but then how much of that detail. And so I just grabbed my iPad and I started recording a video. And, and it wasn't that I wanted to share the imagery with people. I wanted to capture the feeling that I was just awestruck. And I wanted to share that with people, how, how it impacted me. And so um, that really was a powerful moment. And, and, you know, I think the, the, the overview effect, if you've heard about that, seeing the world without borders, without labels, it just as it is, seeing the, the magnitude and the majesty, but also the fragility of the planet has an effect on, on most people who get the privilege of flying to space. 
But it also, since I've been back for a little over six months now, I realized that it's important and it is amazing and it's a privilege to see it. But one of the reasons that it's so powerful and it's so impactful is because of what you build up over your life here on Earth. Seeing an entire ocean, entire body of water from space is amazing. I could see the entire ocean, but it makes you still want to stand on the beach and walk in the surf. And so it's the fact that it connects to your experience on Earth. Being in space just accelerates that and makes you appreciate the planet and appreciate the life that it supports, the fragility of Earth and the preciousness of human life. And so I, it's one of my missions now to try and remind people of that right here on earth that we already start the overview process. The overview effect starts right here in 1G on the surface of the earth with each other. That's spectacular. That's really amazing. Thank you. Gave me new new images of what, what that experience uh, must be like. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Thank you. It is, it's powerful. The earth is amazing. That's earth amazing. Is. It really is. Well, you know, <laughs> When you came back, did anything, you know, in terms of, I know we talked about physically calories and, and nutrition was, was the food, did you pick your food ahead of time? I mean, these are like, did you, you know, what physically, what were you going through? What was it like eating the food there? Did it change? Was it, was it different eating it in zero G than it was on earth? Did you change your calorie count? Did you change your diet specifically for it? Did you, you know, would you, did you get advice from nutritionists saying how it changed or is it pretty much the same as, on earth as it is in the space station? <clears throat> yes. Oh, a, a topic that I really care a lot about. I love to eat and you know, the, the food on space station is great. We have great variety and that's because we've spent years improving it, uh, sort of going from like MREs, like we have in the military to, to reducing the salt, increasing variety uh, and options. Um, we do pick a little bit of the food. There's a standard menu up there that we all share. And then we are able to pick a, a, about 10 to 20% of our food. And they can even go depending on the packaging and if it's if it will last long enough because your food is up there for a year or years before you get there. And so it has to have a safe packaging and, and be shelf stable for long enough. And so uh, I, I had lots of advice. We had nutritionists in a food science lab where we can taste the foods. And the value in that is you know what the entire menu is like, but it also gives you a chance to start thinking about ways to combine and recombine the food to add even more variety to it. Or using one, like I used a lot of tomato basil soup as sauce for other things, putting it on the chicken breast, for example, uh, it just added uh, a little bit of flavor. And so those kinds of things are very important. I also got lots of advice from my crewmates. And in fact, I don't think I took that advice well enough. When they, when they told me, really think about the stuff you can choose. I picked one or two things and I was really happy that they had these dry fruit strips that I really like. And, and so I was like, okay, great. And I've got my coffee. And I wish I would have spent more time and like gone to the store and dedicated some time to looking at different things and, uh, and seeing, hey, I could get that, I could have a few of these and adding even more variety, just maximizing variety and taste and textures because of six months of eating the same things, it is really easy for it to become boring and, and routine. And so we constantly are finding ways to, to, to adapt and, and, and keep it interesting. But yes, eating in space, you adapt, you know, utensils, you don't use utensils like you do on earth. You don't scoop out your soup. Honestly, you cut the corner off not all the way off because now you've created a little piece of trash that's going to float away that you have to go chase. You just cut the corner open enough so that you can get the soup out and you just, you kind of suck it out of the bag. We, we do a lot of eating like kids do, like, like toddlers drink and, and, and they eat their food out of pouches. We, we do that often. And so you don't need utensils as much as, as you do on earth. Drinking water, you know, you need to be careful because the water floats or all of your drinks float. Uh, and so you have to really be intentional. I, I, when I first got there, I was trying to have a, a drink and I was talking to one of my crewmates and I briefly choked and I was like, whoa, okay, no more talking and drinking. I'm just gonna focus on one at a time uh, because uh, this is a new challenge. And so it definitely changes the mode in which you do those things. And, and there's just things that you have to learn in space and you have to learn the lessons space has to teach you. Hot things, hot things 
can be really interesting. Um, you know, on Earth, when something is warm, like your coffee in a mug, the warm air is less dense and so it wafts up and you can smell it and you don't have that sense of smell in space. You have fluid shift, which makes you feel a little more congested, and you also don't have gravity to create that differential that makes warm things rise. So your foods don't smell as strong and it affects the taste. And so we use a lot of condiments to, to make things taste better. Uh, but also, you don't have the sensation of heat. When you pull a, a hot package out of the, 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 the food warmer, it's not, if you're not holding it, you don't sense the heat like you do on a hot plate of food with the warm air rising up to you. So you, you really need to check the temperatures of your food. When I ate my first bag of warm tomato basil soup, my first one in space was cold. The first time I heated it up, I cut the package open. I made a big cut, too big. And so soup was starting to come up out of it. And I put my face down by it. And the soup, as soon as it touches your lip, surface tension and capillary action take over and it wants to spread over your face. And so that's how I found out that it was really hot. And so I grabbed it off my face with my hand, uh, but, but it was really warm and I surprised myself. And so you, that's not something you think about on earth because you can sense the heat and then you can get a spoon out and sort of slurp it and, and check it. And in space, you just have to really be careful uh, about your hot foods. And that's just true about everything. Space requires constant attention. It is mentally fatiguing because everything you do requires constant attention. Yeah, the temperature inside the ISS, I mean, obviously it's closely monitored. Uh, how did that feel for you? The atmosphere inside, the, the, the air, the smell of the air being different. The, the, was there any other things in terms of the electronics of the ISS? And did you feel a difference being in that space? I mean, just the EMFs or you talk about radiation, you know, those, those things in terms of being surrounded by so many electrical uh, devices and the radiation, did you, could you tell uh, and feel a different environment with that on your body? Yes, it's, it's interesting. The, the entire space station is controlled to about 22 degrees Celsius, 72 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And, and so it feels very much like your, your home, except for all the air moves in space station because of a fan. You know, there's no natural circulation. And so because of that, if you stand in one place too long and, and you talk as much as I'm speaking right now, you build up a bubble of CO2, you know, and that definitely has effects. One, one of the most common effects of, of high levels of CO2 are headaches. Um, and so you can also experience air hunger, kind of like the sensation just before you yawn. And so those are things that happen that, that are kind of, kind of compartmentalized depending on where you are and the activity that you're doing. If you're working in one area for a long time, you may want to have a, an extra fan, bring a fan with you to blow air out as you're, as you're sti sitting there breathing and adding CO2. Um, the, but the temperature was very comfortable. But depending on where you're working, sometimes I would go up on the overhead and we generally would have inlets on the deck and, and the outlets for the air conditioning were overhead. So when I would be working up on, on the ceiling, on the overhead, I would be really close to the airflow. And, and you know, with this haircut, it was easy to lose a lot of heat. And so when I was working on the overhead, I would grab a, a hat or a knit cap and I would wear that. And even sometimes I would put on my hoodie just because if my head was losing heat, it made my entire body feel cold. And so it really was, was local specific. The entire space station was very comfortable. Um, but depending on where you worked, you may want to be in your short sleeves or you may need a jacket uh, to stay warm. And then the smell. It's very interesting. When you first get to space station is when you notice the smell the strongest because you kind of get saturated and you get used to it after. But it, it was a, an interesting combination. And again, it's also local. When you go into the module that has the, the lifting, the strength training equipment, that's also where the bathroom is. So that's the most odoriferous module. <laughs> that one smells like a locker room. And so the overall space station, it smells very much like a factory. It has this machine, um, sterile, metallic quality to it. And it very much smells like a workspace. You know, when you walk into a hospital, you sense that, yeah, this smells like a hospital. It's got this antiseptic germ-free quality. And so we work really hard to keep it clean. And it just, you know, between all the machines and the fans on the computers and the, and the, the power boxes on all the hardware, there's this hum and there's a smell, there's a, a visual and, and there's a sound of the space station that kind of, it's almost like a living thing. And, and it's neat because 
If that ever changes, you know the ground did something or something broke and all of us would hear something shut down and go, oh, something just changed and, and the ground would call you. So you get used to all of those those qualities of the space station. It's almost like another crew member up there that you get used to the personality and the characteristics of, of ISS. So it's always that electronic sound throughout. You just, that never all stops. That never stops. All the fans and electronics, there's a, a whir, a hum that just is continuous. And if that ever stops and it gets quiet, quiet would actually make us all go, uh oh, what's wrong? Did we just lose power? What happened? Because there's always some machine running 24 hours a day, 365, 366 in a leap year. It's always moving. So you feel the vibration when you're sleeping. Was it hard to make yourself fall asleep and stay on a schedule with that? Did you feel the vibration? You're hearing the noise. Did you have earplugs? Uh, we, we have earplugs. We also have, you know, sleep medication if you need it. If you wake up and you have trouble going back to sleep, we have lots of options there. Uh, I think I was very fortunate. I did not use earplugs because I wanted to be able to hear if the ground called us or if there was an alarm in the middle of the night. And we actually had several, about a half a dozen times where we were woken up in the middle of the night. Uh, once it was three times in one night and, uh, and you don't ever want to discount them. You want to take each one seriously. Uh, and so I wanted to hear, but I, I uh, didn't have trouble falling asleep. And a part of that is because we sleep in crew quarters. All of us except our commander. We, we increased the normal size of the space station crew from six to seven. And so we didn't yet have an extra room. We call them crew quarters uh, and they're padded on the inside. So when you shut the door, it has its own fan. And other than that fan and your computer, or it, you, music, if you have music playing, you don't hear much when you're in, in your crew quarters. And that's great. You can hop in your sleeping bag. And for me, I, I didn't like to tie my sleeping bag down very tight. Some people tried to recreate the sensation of sleeping on earth and they would put a pillow and try to squeeze themselves up, up against the wall and create the sense of pressure that was uh, would mimic laying down. And I just tried to embrace the floating. And so I tied my sleeping bag at the waist in two places and the rest of it, I let it float. And so I just slept out in the middle of the module and my body was in whatever its normal relaxed position was. And I slept great. I slept great on, on the space station and I actually needed less sleep. I averaged seven hours a night and on earth, I try to get eight hours a night, but at seven hours, my, I could, my eyes would fly open and I would be rested and ready to start the day. That was very interesting. And did you feel a difference in your sleep on earth from when you came back? Did it, when you, when the gravity, did it change any, did you feel any physical effects? Um, coming back to earth, uh, I had to get used to lying down again. And, and then especially sitting up, my midsection was so weak, so weak compared to before I flew that when I would sit up, it was a, a concerted effort, you know, and then just getting stable and then standing up. That was a, an interesting thing to lie down all night and then sit up. Um, uh, but, but overall the sleep quality, I think my sleep, once I was asleep was very much in space, like it was on earth. And that was nice because sleep is very important to me. Just food, sleep, flying. Those are things that I very much love. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. By the way, speaking of flying, I'm, I'm talking to you now uh, from England at a great, uh, you know, airfield Duxford at the, uh, it's a restoration center. This is a Spitfire behind me right here. You know, so these guys, and I don't know if you can see it on the, on the scene. I can, and it's beautiful. Mark told me where you are, and that is, I'm jealous. Uh, this is a cool view, but there's no airplane behind me. That's that's awesome. That's a very <laughs> cool view. This this airplane, you know, that's what we're doing. We're flying a bunch of stuff and, you know, working on, we're awesome. releasing Top Gun and we're working on missions. So being a I'm fighter jealous. pilot, I know. I'm jealous. I know, I'm man. Jealous. We're going <laughs> to, I'll be flying this thing. When I get off here, we're going to go fly some Spitfires. You got Mustang here, too. Oh, very yeah. cool. Wow. Well, if, you ever, if you're ever in, uh, where, where are you now? Are you in uh, California? Where are you? I'm in Houston. Just oh, Houston, yeah, South nice. Houston. Well, you tell me you ever get to California. I have a P-51 out there. You, you can go have a flight if you want it. You just tell me. Okay, I've so. P-51. So we go skydiving with P-51 school. stuff. Oh. You, okay, you had me at hello. Uh, yes, sign me up. <laughs> I, I flew 35 airplanes in test pilot school and two that I never got to fly that I always wanted to fly were the F-14 Tomcat and the P-51 Mustang. 
The test pilot school wasn't able to get a P-51 that year. Sometimes they do, but we didn't get one. So that's on my bucket list. Well, good, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that bucket list for you. We got some good pilots oh, deal. taking you through awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get that done. Now, let me see. Awesome. We talked through your science experiments. I'm going to kind of look at the questions I that we had written down. I want to make sure, you know, we went through the sleep. Okay. And, you know, one of the things that I'd like to discuss also is the, the team dynamic, the preparation for that. I mean, being in such close quarters, you know, uh, obviously you went through the Air Force Academy, you know, you know, the preparation, you know, understanding the military teamwork and the flow of communication. Was that different with the ISS? Was that different with this team? Is there, you know, did you find in terms of everyone under stress or personal conflict and how to resolve those conflicts when you're there so that it's, it's, did you guys have to have, uh, you know, those, that kind of training in terms of dealing with that, that, those situations when they arise? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's time well spent. And, and that's what I would say is it takes intention and it takes time. You have to put in work uh, for self-care, learning how to take care of yourself and understanding uh, what, what gets you going and what, what makes you stop. And, and then also team care, how you fit into the role of a high performing, high functioning team that has to work in this isolated, confined and extreme environment. And so uh, I think the, uh, the, the effort that we take on the ground in training is really to give you a tool bag, a set of tools that you can use when you need them. And it's important to understand them as a, a suite of tools because you, just like spacewalking and science, you really don't know what it's like until you get there. There's a part of, of your mission that is going to affect you socially and emotionally, and you don't know how that's gonna affect you until you get there. For example, on Earth, I would consider myself uh, an extrovert's extrovert, a type A extrovert. I love being with people and, and communicating and telling stories and hearing stories, and that gives me energy. On the ISS, if I had a free moment, I wanted to be by myself because you're constantly engaged with things and people and getting instruction and giving a report. And there's so much extrovertism that I needed to just be by myself to recharge. And that surprised me. And so, so it's important to have your tools so that in, in space, in the moment, you can actually contrive something. You can use the basic building blocks that we study on earth to create whatever it is that you need when you're in the environment. Uh, I like to tell this story about, you know, working together. It's important to train with folks on the ground so that you know them. And Mike Hopkins, our, our Dragon commander, he and I were together for three years prior to this mission. And over time, we developed a couple of things. We, we would say, hey, if we're ever talking to the ground and you hear me say something and you think I'm being too pushy, uh, you know, we both played college football. And so we came up with this saying, take a knee take a knee. And that was if we thought we were being too pushy with the, with the ground or, or with each other, take a knee. And we, we agreed, we had trust in each other uh, that if we ever heard that, it was an automatic stop and then we would do whatever our other crewmates suggested. And, and we also came up with another saying over time that was if we were doing something that, uh, you know, maybe seemed tedious or we had just done it and the ground said, hey, we need you to do this, and, and we could tell that that might be a frustrating uh, item for, for each other that we would say over the, over the uh, intercom or if we were floating by, we would just say, this is the mission. You know, we're both military officers also, and sometimes you just got to follow orders and salute and carry on. And so we would say to each other, this is the mission. And over time, because the, the TV show, The Mandalorian was out and they, in that they say, uh, this is the way, this is the way. And so we adapted it. Uh, because we loved watching The Mandalorian. We took a baby Yoda to space as our zero G indicator. And so we started saying, this is the way. And we actually used that one all the time. And it was mostly uh, in humor. It was mostly a joke. You know, we'd hear something come up from the ground and we'd be in a completely different module. And one of us would yell, this is the way, you know, and everybody would laugh uh, because we understood what, what was going on. Uh, but the, the other one, the taking a knee, we never had to use that in space. But I think it's important that we had to come up with that. And I think because we put the time to develop a system to hold each other accountable, but also to build trust to use that system of accountability, 
I think that's one of the reasons that we never actually had to use it. And that's a good thing. I think that's a, a win. And so overall, though, it's important to, to intentionally take time to do self-care and team care training, and then to have the time dedicated to doing it. And sometimes we're going to have to do it in, in real time. We're getting ready to launch a private mission to the space station. And as we do that, we're gonna have less time to be together on the ground. And I think it's important for us to consider time on the space station that we dedicate solely to building team camaraderie and morale. Uh, so that those folks can be effective, as effective as they can be in space. Because it, again, it requires intentionality and it requires time. That makes total sense. That's, that makes total sense. That's excellent. Now also just going on the journey six and a half hours to the space station. What was that like? That's six and a half hours of you. At a certain point, you've had the G, you've had the ride into space and now you're just, did you feel like, okay, I'm. I'm ready to get there. Let's, you know, what was going through your mind beforehand? Were you thinking? So, you know, it can be, uh, it, it can be as short as, as about six and a half hours, or it can be much longer. Sometimes it can take up to two days. In the Soyuz, it used to take 48 hours. Uh, they can get there as short as six hours. And so our rendezvous actually was in between. It was 27 hours. And so after the exhilarating ride of about nine minutes into orbit, um, we had over a day before we could dock with the space station. And, you know, it was that's when I had my first view of Earth from space. I had my first meal, uh, macadamia nuts and cold tomato soup. And the first time I got to use the bathroom in space. And so it was fun. But after trying to go to sleep, that's when I realized, okay, I'm ready to be on the space station because I slept in my chair so I could see the displays. If something happened, uh, I would be right there at my workstation ready to you know, get back to piloting Crew Dragon resilience. And so you actually don't sleep well in the spacecraft. You, you really nap. It's really snacking instead of having a meal and napping instead of getting a good night's sleep. And so after just taking naps, over a day, when I got to the space station, I knew that that was where I was going to get my first good sleep. So I was ready. It's very cool. That's very cool. Now you are also you're the first crew that landed at night since 1968, since Lovell and Anders and Borman, the Apollo 8 mission. Now, what what was that like? I mean, how aggressive was the landing? What happened immediately after splashdown? I mean, what you know, what was it like coming back six months later, hitting hitting the water? What, did you feel? Was it rocking? Did you feel the, the impact of the water? Was it, did they have some special system that, that carried you a little bit, uh, took some of the load in the chair? So it's, uh, it, it is actually a really neat uh, thing to come back to Earth after six months. You know, when we first hit the atmosphere, we do a deorbit burn, which uh, decelerates the spacecraft. So it starts to descend and then it hits the atmosphere and the drag of the air starts to slow it down. In fact, that drag, you're going so fast, that friction heats up and, and it ignites the air around the vehicle, creating a plasma cloud. That's why you come back to Earth in a fireball. And so that heat shield's doing its job. But that's also when you start to feel your first G again. And so as the G on the spacecraft builds up, you start to feel your weight again. And that's really interesting after being weightless for six months. That's the first sensation. Then when we got to about uh, 18,000 feet, uh, the drogue parachutes come out. And so the G has been coming up. And so just like on launch, the G is into your chest because now we turn the spacecraft backwards to put the heat shield into the wind. So the pressure is still going into the chest, making it hard to breathe. You feel like your face is doing this, being stretched out. And so you get to 18,000 feet and then the drogue parachutes come out. And that is very visceral. The vehicle moves and you feel it swaying. We call that a Dutch roll. It's like rolling and pitching and yawing all at the same time. And then it stabilizes and those drug chutes start to slow you down and get you into the envelope where the main parachutes come out. And then those big parachutes come out and they, they reef. They start off very uh, closed and then they open slightly and then open all the way over time. And so you can actually feel that. It's almost like hanging on the end of a bungee cord. When they first come out, it jerks the vehicle and you kind of bounce. You almost feel like you're going over a bump in a car. I felt a little bit of a light sensation 
after feeling the first G, then I, to feel weightless again was very interesting. And then they widen out and slow you down again. And so you feel again, the same uh, jerking sensation. And then uh, from about 6,000 feet down to the surface, you're riding under these big four parachutes. And we were, uh, we, you touched down doing about 27 feet per second. If you skydive, you know, most parachutes get you between 20 and 30 uh, feet per second or seven uh, uh, meters per second when you touch down. And that's about what, what uh, sport parachutes bring you down to the ground at. So that's about the same velocity that we hit the water with. And you know, the water is a nicer place to touch down than the land. And so the, the, the touchdown was actually quite soft because it gives, the, the spacecraft settles into the water a little bit and then rebounds and then bounces. And because it was night and the seas were nice and calm, it felt like we were just gently rocking. You couldn't see the horizon outside. So there wasn't a sense of you know disorientation, which I was very worried about. It felt nice and calm, like I was sitting in a rocking chair, just going back and forth. And it actually felt very good. It felt very comforting. However, it was at that time, I'm now back in 1G, I feel my 200 pounds, and that's when I noticed I had to pee. I could also feel the weight of my bladder for the first time, and it was a really interesting wow. sensation after wow. not having it for six months. <laughs> wow. You, for six months, you did not have that feeling at all. Well, not the weight. You know, it's really interesting because you have to really go regularly and encourage yourself to go because by the time you feel that, it means your bladder's really full because you don't have the weight. It means it, you know, volume wise has filled up. So, yeah, to feel the weight again now, it was like, whoa, I've got to go now. <laughs> <laughs> and what about your strength and or otherwise when you when you got up and started walking again? What was that like? Yes. So you have a recovery crew that gets you out of the seat, takes you out the hatch and gets you to the edge of the vehicle once we were up on the boat. Right. And uh, and so we're still on the ocean, you know, we're on the recovery ship and things are swaying. And now, like I said, I've been working out, eating well in space and I felt strong. I felt really strong. And uh, we get up and I've got two people helping me and they, I get up and I feel strong standing up. I can easily lift my weight. But then that ship motion it rocks one way and my head almost hit the person on my left. I mean, my head felt so heavy and then it goes back the other way and my head feels so heavy. And I was really grateful that I had people helping me because had that rocking motion happened and I was standing up by myself, I would have tumbled over to the ground. I felt really strong, but I had no sense of balance. I was a 45 year old toddler. It was really interesting because I know how to walk. It's in there, the memory's there, but it was really difficult to, to ambulate. I could stand up, but I could not resist the rocking motion of the ship. How long did it take for you to recover that? Interesting question. So I, yeah, I, I wrote it down in my journal because it was interesting. Every hour I got a little more capability back, it became a little more comfortable. And it was about the four hour point, we had flown a helicopter off the ship to Pensacola. And at Navy Pensacola, we had to go through a series of tests to sit down, stand up, lie down and stand up to check orthostatic intolerance to make sure our heart was pumping sufficient blood to our brain to keep us conscious. And so doing that test is when I realized, OK, this is the point where I would be comfortable, uh, you know, building a habitat on Mars or on the moon. And so if you fly to Mars, it's going to take you six to nine months. I was on the ISS for six to nine months. You're going to get to Mars and you're going to be in, you know, ab about um, a third of, of gravity of Earth. So that's going to be different, but you're going to be back in some sense of weight. Uh, and it's going to take me about four hours to get to the point where I can comfortably move around and get myself out of the vehicle. That's a data point that I very much wanted to know and to keep. So I wrote it in my journal. And those are the kinds of things I think we need to extract from ISS missions as they relate to going on. You know, our Artemis program is gonna get us to the moon to stay and then eventually on to Mars. And we need to start capturing all of those lessons about how our bodies are affected. Were your fellow astronauts, was it the same time period for them? Those four hours? Uh, just or, or observing, you know, I just see them doing their, yeah, I, I think it was about the same. Maybe some a little sooner, maybe some a little slower, but I think about that time we were all feeling good. And then a few hours after that, we flew from Pensacola back to Houston and our families were there to meet us at the airfield. And each one of us was able to walk down the stairs of the plane and walk to our vans 
uh, to then go back to the, the crew quarters, the quarantine facility. And so I think all of us were about on that same uh, recovery pace. So how long before you felt you feel you could fly an airplane or, you know, uh, drive a car, <laughs> ride a motorcycle on a racetrack? How long for that? So the doctors evaluate us for about two weeks and they generally won't let you, even if you tell them, doc, I feel great. They, they, they make you wait two weeks. And so at about two weeks, I felt like I could have driven a car. I probably would have waited a little bit. I, I did. I waited a little longer before flying. Actually, I waited even before driving. They let me have a driver for three weeks. And so I took advantage and just kept the driver for three weeks. And I started driving at three weeks. I felt great. And so it was about a month after that, I started flying again. And uh, I'm glad I, I, I got back into flying early, but I didn't go too early. I didn't want to have to worry. Flying is already hard enough and takes enough focus and attention uh, that I didn't want to add on to that now, worrying if my ability, uh, just because I'd returned to earth, was, was going to be there. So I wanted to wait until I, I knew that I, I, was, I was ready. That's also another interesting thing to keep in mind in terms of when you land on Mars or the moon, if you're operating machinery, how long that period from will it take to get there, that zero G, to then before you're able to start handling different kinds of machinery or, you know, how, how ambulatory can you be? What kind of stress can the body, and not just physically, but mentally, can you, can you handle once you get there? Right. And, and, and I had a special team, my, those ACERs that I keep bringing up, such an amazing group of folks that I had dedicated two hours every day working on strength, balance. We were doing toe touches and bending down to the ground, standing on one leg, you know, standing on the, the BOSU balls to work balance. I had a professional working with me every day for two hours, seven days a week. Uh, to help get me back. And we did that for 45 days. So again, you're right. That is absolutely the kinds of things that we need to know so that crew members can do those things for themselves because you're not going to have, you know, this amazing training team with you there on Mars. You're going to have to know what, what works and what doesn't work. And you're also going to have to know I'm not going to drive a forklift right now because I would be a danger to myself and my crewmates and that forklift. So it's going to take me probably 45 days before I'm going to do the really high value, uh, high risk uh, operations. Well, that's really interesting. Now, Victor, I could talk to you. I could stay here all day. And we have a worldwide audience of extreme Me medics too. listening, listening to you, you know, and they want to use the medical training as a powerful force for good, pushing the boundaries of extreme medicine. Now, is there anything that you would like to say to them now, give them a, a message? before we close? Absolutely. Yes, thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. That's what I wanna say is thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, as our, as our planet is still, you know, experiencing this pandemic, I think all of us have healthcare workers uh, and professionals and, and, and janitorial workers and professionals on our minds all the time. And, and then you add something to that, you know, in church, it really impacted me when I was young and I heard someone say to me, you have to meet people where they are. You have to take your gifts to people. You have to meet people where they are. And I think of the, the, the extreme medical community as not only this, this great group of folks that provide healthcare, but you do it in isolated, confined, extreme, and hostile sometimes environments. You take this life-saving care and meet people where they are. And, and so I just want to express my gratitude and my, my awe that, that you are able to do things that most people can't even do so that you can provide health care to people in these extreme uh, circumstances. Thank you. I think what you do is commendable and I look up to you and, and, and I really want to be like you. I hope to engage in more uh, training for uh, extreme environments. Uh, and, you know, they say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. And, and I desire to be very much like you all. Thank you for your service. That was excellent. I, I agree with you, Victor. You are impressive. And what you've accomplished thus far is absolutely impressive. Absolutely engaging, incredibly informative. And uh, I'm grateful to be here. And I'm grateful also to all, all these people out there that are helping people. And just want to thank you. I'm going to, you're yes. going to get you. And Tom, it's, you want to. 
Yes, sir. Yes, please. And it's <laughs> been so it, amazing to talk to you. Oh, I'm ready to go. And thank you for I'm this. It has been a too, treat. I, I showed up. I, I showed up here today, and you know, I saw this on the calendar, and I read the papers and stuff. But I still asked my my public affairs team, this awesome group of pros, and I said, "Hey, guys, I just want to get this straight." So. Tom Cruise is going to ask me questions today. <laughs> I, just, I just figured there was a typo somewhere. So this has truly been a treat. Tom, thank you so much for the time. And I hope you enjoy flying that Spitfire. That is, that's going to be amazing. Thank you, man. You'll, we'll, you'll, we'll get you to P-51. I enjoyed this immensely. Awesome. Incredibly informative. I'm just very grateful to have this opportunity. And thank you. Same. Me too. Thank you.